Deuteronomy 22, 13. Our text will be verses 13 through the end of the chapter. Let's pray. Father, would you open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things in your law. We thank you for the gift of your word, and we pray that as we discuss what it means, that you would be given glory for who you are. We pray that you would help us to see how Jesus fulfilled the law and that his work might be exalted. We pray that your spirit would be among us, opening our ears and our hearts, opening my mouth to say what you want me to say. We pray, Lord, that if any here don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself to repentance and faith. We pray, God, that you would feed each one of us and that you would help us to remember that all scripture is profitable and inspired and that you use it for our good. So as we come to a difficult text, We pray, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us. We know that you will. Your word tells us that you do. We pray that you would help us to expectantly read your word, knowing that you have something for us, that we might grow and be conformed to the image of Jesus by the power of your spirit. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I've told you, we are... Did I use the word doldrums last time? As far as Deuteronomy goes, doldrums is probably not the right word because it's disparaging towards God's word. I would say that we're in the wilderness of Deuteronomy, but ironically, the book of Numbers in Hebrew is in the wilderness, so that title is already taken. We're going to be in probably the most difficult portion of Deuteronomy until June. Um, Then once we get through that, it's third base and it's just headed home from there, and and I'm confident that unless Christ returns first, which we're all hoping that he will, I trust, that we will be done with Deuteronomy this year. With that being said, the text that we're dealing with today is a difficult one because it is dealing primarily with the neglect and the abuse of marriage. The neglect and the abuse of marriage. And let me tell you, as you probably already know, and as we're going to see in the text, when we neglect marriage and when we abuse marriage, things get ugly, don't they? So we're going to read a series of laws dealing with the neglect and the abuse of marriage. And on its face, it's going to be super icky, and it's actually going to seem cruel. For example, that a woman is married to her rapist. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text, and we're going to go, ouch, how do you deal with that? And then I'm going to give you two stories of marriage and two, story, two considerations that will help us make more sense of the text. Does that sound good? All right, let's read the text. Deuteronomy 22, starting in verse 13. If any man takes a wife and goes into her, and then he hates her, and accuses her of misconduct and brings a bad name upon her, saying, I took this woman, and when I came near her, I did not find in her the evidence of virginity. Then the father of the young woman and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of her virginity to the elders of the city and in the gate. And the father of the young man shall say to the elders... I gave my daughter to this man to marry, and he hates her. And behold, he has accused her of misconduct, saying, I did not find in your daughter evidence of virginity. And yet this evidence, and yet this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloak before the elders of that city. Then the elders of that city shall take the man and whip him. They shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give him to the father of the young woman, or, and then give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife." He may not divorce her all his days. But if the thing is true that the evidence of virginity was not found in the young woman, they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done an outrageous thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. If a man is found lying with the wife of another woman, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city and you shall stone them to death with stones, the young woman because she did not cry for help although she was in the city, and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. But 
If in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed, and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lie with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death. For this, is the, this case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor because he met her in an open country, and though the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one to rescue her. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. Interesting. <laughs> Difficult. What I want to do to, before we go back into the discussion is I want to give you two stories of marriage, rather the abuse of marriage and the neglect of marriage. Then I want to give you two cultural considerations. After that, we'll come back to the text and I think we won't see it in black and white anymore. I think we'll see it in color. Now, Remember what I told you a few weeks ago. The law was not meant to fix a broken world. The law is meant to restrain sin in a broken world, among other things. And so I told you a few weeks ago, and if you weren't here with us, the law is more like an amputation. You have an infection in your body that's spreading, and the best way to save the person is to, to amputate that limb and so that infection doesn't spread to the rest of the world. The law is kind of like that. The law doesn't fix the curse of sin. Only Jesus can fix the curse of sin. And so it's, it's, it's not in the law of Moses that we hope. We do see good in it. We do see that, that, that God has written it and that it's for our good and it's to, to profit us. But I would remind you before we even get going, is the law harsh sometimes? Sure. Does the law not make sense to us some, sometimes? Sure. But it's better than the alternative. Now, what's the alternative? Let me tell you two stories of non-marriage. Number one. Have you ever heard of dowry deaths? Dowry deaths are something that happen in a number of nations um, in East Asia. So India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, Iran, maybe, maybe one or two others. A dowry death is when I am not satisfied with the dowry that I receive from my in-laws. So you know what I do? I murder my wife. Or I abuse my wife and drive her to suicide, or I force her to commit suicide. Do you know why? So then I can get remarried and get another dowry. Do you think that's an old thing? It's not. Something that's happening today. In fact, the last statistic that I looked up a couple weeks ago, there were about 6,000 of them last year. Last year, 2023, in the nation of India. That's a thing that happens. Let me tell you another story of non-marriage or the neglect of marriage or the abuse of marriage. This is not an old story. This is not from India. This is from the United States today. One of you told me this story. One of you has a relative who is your sister. You're, uh, she's a female and she's been divorced. And after she got divorced, she kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater and was like, you know, that whole marriage thing is just this old patriarchal tool of oppression to hold women down, to keep them barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. You, we've heard that, haven't we? So what does she do? She moves in with a guy, and the guy's rich. And they were together for, I think it was over 20 years. And the guy got old, and he died, and they never got married. And he never signed over any of his assets or his money to her. And so when he died, guess what happened? His money went to his kids. And they kept it, and they were just fine. She didn't see a dime. And in her 70s, she had to go work as a cashier. Right? It's not to knock being a cashier, but it is to say that, look, people look at marriage, and it's a precious and a wonderful gift that God has given us, and they say, no, it's a tool of oppression. Karl Marx called it the bourgeois family. And what our job is to do is to tear it down and, and, and recreate some institute that'll, that'll, that'll cause women to flourish. But do you see what happens is marriage is, first of all, it's a gift from God. It is a wonderful thing, and it protects women and children. It protects family. It builds up society. And when we neglect marriage and when we abuse marriage, things get ugly. Now, let me give you two considerations that are cultural that will help us understand this text a little bit better. 
The first one is that honor played a factor in other cultures that it doesn't play in ours. You've heard of guilt, innocence cultures. You've heard of honor, shame cultures. That's a little bit overplayed, but I, I'll say this. Honor plays in other places around the world and in, and in biblical Israel and probably in Israel today, honor played a motivating factor in, in life and in family life and in society that, that we, it just doesn't do for us. Now, what do I mean by honor? I mean reputation. When a person is honorable, they can withstand the public eye. They can legitimately receive praise from society. God looks on them well. And if people do criticize them, they can handle it because they're an honorable person. They have a good reputation with at least somebody. A shameful person is a person who cannot stand in public and cannot stand before God. A shameful person, if they receive praise from society, it ought not to be. A shameful person is someone who ought not to stand before God and before the public eye. They have no reputation. Now, we have honor and shame in our culture. We just don't talk about it as much. And, and think about it this way. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, they did not just incur guilt. They incurred shame. They were no longer able to stand in God's presence. They were no longer able to dwell in nakedness. They're, they're not just their guilt, their innocence changed, but their honor also changed, and they were driven out. They were exiled from the garden. Now, now take that to the gospel. Jesus did not just bear our guilt. Scripture also tells us that Jesus bore our shame. And when we sinned, we lost our reputation with God. We were driven out of his presence. And the work of the gospel is not just him erasing our guilt, although it is. That's another place where it's overplayed. It's like, well, it's not about guilt. It's about, and people dismantle the gospel. I'm not doing that. I'm saying it's more than guilt. I'm saying that Jesus did not just erase our penalty. Jesus did not just erase our sin. Jesus took away our shame when he was not just beat, but he was humiliated. He was naked on a cross for the world to see. God was humiliated for us. And because Jesus was humiliated, he doesn't just impute righteousness to us, he joins us to himself and we thereby receive honor and in the honor of Jesus Christ, we can return to the presence of the Father. Now, do you see honor, what I'm getting at here is that honor and shame play a role that we have in 21st century America, we just don't talk about it very much. Now, honor plays a significant factor in what we talk about in, in the text to come. Now, there's another consideration that I want to give to you. And it's that in these days that Moses writes, and perhaps in other cultures around the world now today, if a woman was not a virgin, she was not eligible for marriage. Not legally, but practically. If a woman loses her virginity before she's married, she is pretty much taken off the market. Now, to prove this point, you can go read 2 Samuel, and there's a story where David's son Amnon rapes David's daughter Tamar. And it says that she was left desolate, and that she went and lived in the household of her brother Absalom, and Absalom provided for her. Why? Because she was not going to get married. No man would marry her. And what I read is that oftentimes, if that happened to a woman, if she lost her virginity before marriage, one of the only avenues that she had for, for, um, for provision was to go to prostitution. So a conclusion from that in this kind of a culture is that it's better to be a live bride than a desolate widow. It's better to be a bride who is fed and has children and has a husband taking care of her, even if he's a dirtbag. It's better for her to have a full belly and a secure future than it is for her to be desolate and alone. Now, I'm not saying that's the way things ought to be. I'm saying that as the text addresses society, that's the way things are in Israel's culture. So keep those things in mind. Dowry deaths, the way that marriage is neglected today and what it does to women today, honor, virginity, all those things matter as we come back to the text, okay? So now we're going to address a number of issues in which marriage is either neglected or abused. The first one is a case of abuse, and this is what we find in verses 13 and following. 
And this is if, if, if a man decides he's going to accuse his new bride of not being a virgin. If a man takes a wife and goes into her and hates her and accuses her of misconduct and brings a bad name upon her, saying, I took this woman when I came near her and I did not find in her the evidence of virginity. Then the father of the young woman and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of virginity to say to the elders, in the, to the elders of the city gate. And the father of the young man shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man to marry, and he hates her. And behold, he has accused her of misconduct, saying, I did not find in your daughter evidence of virginity, and yet this is the, daughter, the evidence of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloak before the elders of that city. Then the elders of that city shall take the man and whip him. They shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not divorce her all his days. But if the thing is true that the evidence of virginity was not found in the woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her to death with stones, because she's done an outrageous thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. Let's deal with the easy part first, easier comparatively speaking. If it's true that she's committed adultery and if they can prove it, it's a case of adultery and she gets stoned to death. Okay? But what about the part where there's a little bit of question here? Let me make a couple of clarifying remarks if you're not picking them up. Number one, the evidence of virginity that we talk about in verse 15 and in, 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 in verse 17, most people agree that it is a garment stained with blood that was produced on the wedding night. Other pe there's, there were a couple people that I read that they don't believe that. They believe it's something else. But from what I can gather, most people believe that the evidence of virginity is a garment or a bed sheet that has blood on it that was produced from the wedding night. Okay? Now, what some of you might be thinking is, well, what if blood is not produced on the wedding night? Because that happens. Can this guy then just accuse her of not being a virgin and then she gets stoned to death, and then he gets, see, he gets his dowry back. Some people think that's the motivation here. In some cultures, a dowry works one way or the other. In India, I told you, the in-laws give the dowry to the son, but in this culture, the son gives the dowry to the in-laws, or the son-in-law gives the dowry to the in-laws. And so some people think this might be financially motivated. If he can accuse her of not being a virgin, he can get his dowry back and then maybe get, you know, go his own way. So could a groom hypothetically charge his wife of not being a virgin there's no evidence of virginity because blood wasn't produced and then she gets killed and he gets his money back and he gets away scot-free like a scoundrel is that possible it is possible but here's where we bring back our consideration of honor honor played a factor in this culture that it does not play in our culture and when you see this law through the lens of what it meant to be an honorable man, this is one big barrier against an honorable man going through something like this to accuse his wife. Now, here's what I mean by this. I want you to think about if this guy makes this accusation against his bride and it's not true. I want you to think what's going to happen. Number one, his marital business is going to become the city's business. His father-in-law is going to go to the elders of the city gate and say, this scoundrel accused my daughter of not being a virgin on the wedding night. Now look, we live in the age of tabloids. We live in the age where we love, maybe not you, I presume not any of you, but in our culture, people love to follow celebrity gossip. And a couple gets divorced and they start making all kinds of accusations against each other and it's in the news and it's on the internet and it's in the newspapers and we're like, that's really interesting. It's not. It's shameful. Those kinds of things should not be discussed in public. Now, do you see what happens? In an ideal world, a man who has any kind of honor is not going to want to go through something like this because it's going to, his marital business is going to become city business. Nobody wants that. Well, some people do. No reasonable person wants that. No honorable person wants that. Now, I want you to think about this. If this scoundrel decides he's going to accuse his wife of being a non-virgin, do you know what else that means? He is going to be in court against his in-laws. Now look, some of us have wonderful in-laws. Some of us have less than wonderful in-laws. Don't look at each other. <laughs> 
But I think we can all agree nobody wants to be in court against their in-laws. Do they? If this guy's going to make a flippant accusation to get his dowry back, that his wife's not a virgin when he gets married, he's going to have to go to court against his in-laws. Who wants that? A shameless scoundrel would want that. Now, I want you to think about what else he's going to go through. If he's, if he's proven wrong and if his, if his in-laws are vindicated, it says in verse 18, the elders of the city shall take that man and whip him. He is going to be publicly whooped and humiliated. And then it says, they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin of Israel. He has to pay a hundred shekels of silver to his father-in-law. Now you say, how much is that? It's kind of hard to calculate just based on the weight because silver had differing values, not just in our culture, but in theirs. It's not super easy to come up with a dollar amount, but it is safe to say that it is twice the bride price. So if he's wrong, he has to pay two more dowries to his father-in-law. That's going to discourage him from trying to get the one dowry back, right? Because in the end, he's going to end up paying three. He's going to have to fine his father-in-law, or he's going to be fined, and he's going to have to pay his father-in-law. You notice verse 19 says, he may not divorce her all his days. Now, this is where you go, well, she shouldn't want to be married to that guy anymore, right? Well, not in our culture, no. But what was our second consideration? Non-virgin equals non-marriageable, and it's better to be a live bride than a dead widow. Right? It's better to be a, a, a woman living under maybe an unhappy roof with a, with, a, with a dirt bag of a husband. It's better for her to be alive and full than it is for her to be on her own. Now, there's another consideration here, too, that comes up in Exodus chapter 22. The same situation comes up in Exodus, and, and it's not given here, but Moses says that Actually, the father had the final word on this one. It's not just as simple as saying, okay, now you have to marry my daughter. It's the father, oh, never mind, never mind. Scratch that, erase that. That's in a later situation. We'll come back to it, okay? So what are we, what are we looking at with this, acu this accusation of her not, having, not being a virgin? Is it possible for this guy to make this kind of an accusation, to get his dowry back, and to worm his way out of a marriage? It's possible, but this law is one big barrier that keeps him from going through something like that because of the amount of shame he would have to bring on himself, on her, on his family, and on her family. Now, there's one more consideration here that'll help make sense of this. Joseph found himself in the situation, didn't he? Remember? Jesus' adopted father found himself in this situation. His bride was pregnant before they got married. You know what it says Joseph did? Joseph was a righteous man. And so he had determined he did not want to put her to open shame. And so he tried to find some kind of way to divorce her quietly. Now, do I know what that looks like? No, it didn't come to that. We don't know what that would have looked like. But what does it tell us? It tells us when a righteous man comes up against this situation, he won't touch this process with a 10-foot pole. So what's the point of the law? The point of the law is it keeps scoundrels, shameless villains, from flippantly deciding to say, you know, my bride wasn't a virgin. I'd like my dowry back, please. Keeps them from abusing and neglecting marriage in that kind of a way. Hopefully, if a guy is that kind of a shameless scoundrel, the in-laws will catch that and not give him to be married in the first place. Now, we have another situation that comes up in verse 22. This is adultery. Verse 22 if a man is found lying with the wife of another woman, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. There's just a couple things to consider here. Number one, God considers adultery a matter of life and death. Our culture doesn't. We think it's fun. We think it's necessary. You've got to get out there and figure some stuff out. You've got to test drive the car before you move in. Right? Jordan Peterson. Somebody said, why, would you test, why don't you test drive the car? And he said, because women aren't cars. But one thing that I would point out here is just that both sides are held responsible. That's not always the case. Scripture says, if it's a case of adultery, two adults consenting to violate a marriage, then those both deserve to die. Do you remember when Jesus was brought a woman caught in adultery? They just brought the one. She was the only one that was held responsible. And in our culture, it, you kind of ask, it depends on who you ask, but people won't blame both sides. People will blame one side or the other. 
they'll say, well, you know, it's okay for a man to get out there, and it, so is wild oats. I mean, that's, that's kind of comes with the territory, but it's not okay for a woman to sleep around, right? That's gross. Some people say it's the other way around. No, men should, you know, it's wrong for men to do that, but women can do whatever they want. They need to be empowered. People, sometimes, a lot of times, they hold one side or other responsible, not Scripture. Scripture says both are guilty. If two people consent, if they conspire to violate a marriage, you know, that, that's, that's the, the baseline standard for our culture, right? It's just got to be consent. No. Both sides are held responsible and both sides die. Pretty simple. Now, here it gets tough again because we have three cases of a virgin being violated from verses 23 to 29. And there's two considerations here. Number one, is she betrothed? And number two, does she consent? Verse 23, if there's a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the city of that gate or the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife, you shall purge the evil from your midst. So if, if, if she's betrothed and they consent to violate her betrothal, to violate her marriage, it is treated as adultery, and they are both stoned to death, just like the case of adultery. In this culture, betrothal was as legal as marriage. You just hadn't moved in together yet. And so to violate a betrothal is to violate a marriage. And in that case, if she's betrothed and she consents, you both die, just like adultery. Verse 25, another example. She's betrothed, but she doesn't consent. If in the open country a man meets a young woman who's betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her, then, the only, then only the man who lie with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death. This case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor because he met her in the open country and though the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one to rescue her. If she's not able to cry for help and she's raped, then she's not punished. She has done nothing wrong. He is stoned to death for rape. That's pretty simple. I feel like we're probably tracking. But now here comes the really tricky one. Verse 28. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they're found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. This is the tricky one, isn't it? Because you're going, wait, now he... he rapes her, and then he gets to marry her. So what's going to keep this guy from going seven brides for seven brothers and just going out and kidnapping anybody that he wants? You have to remember the two considerations. One is honor. The other one is the provision. If she is not a virgin, no man is going to marry her. She is going to end up desolate. And so if she gets raped by this guy, first of all, Everybody's going to know that he had to marry her out of a rape, and he is going to be a scoundrel for the rest of his life. There's a prevention from him wanting to do this. The other one is that he's going to have to provide for her for the rest of his life. So you might want to think twice about raping that young girl. So you see, there's, we look at it and we go, wait, hold on. This doesn't make sense here. But there's different factors in the culture that help make more sense of it in biblical culture. Now, here's the thing that I brought up earlier that I wasn't supposed to bring up that I'm bringing up now, okay? In this case, in Exodus 22, I think it's Exodus 22, the father has the final say. If his daughter gets raped and the father says, no, that guy, that is not, he is not going to marry my daughter, then the father got the final word on that. And so it's not as simple as, oh, she gets raped and therefore she has to marry this guy. It's not that simple, okay? Now, we have one final consideration of neglect of marriage or sexual immorality, and that's verse 30. A man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. Most people agree this is not your biological mother. This is your stepmother. Your mother dies. Your father gets remarried. Your father has multiple wives. You are not allowed to sleep with any of the wives of your mother. It is shameful. Um, does this really need any more comment? Yuck, right? If you want to read more about it, which of course you do, go to Leviticus 18. And there, there's more about it there. There's a couple things that are going to come up in Deuteronomy that I'm not going to comment on. Okay, there, I'm just going to say, we good? Do We don't need to talk about this, do we? Can we move on? So, 
What do we have? We have marriage being neglected and marriage being abused. A young man accusing his bride of um, adultery before marriage, adultery itself, uh, virgins being violated under different conditions, and incest. Shall we pray? <laughs> Shall we call it a day? You're, you're wondering, what do, we do, what do we do from here? That's a good question. What in the world do we do from here? There's two things looming in the background that we'll cover on, and, and then we'll call it a day. Number one is marriage, and number two is Jesus. The first thing that's looming in the background is the fact that it's not just a bunch of thou shalt nots. It's not just that God has said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's the fact that God has already told us what to do instead. It's the fact that from the beginning, God made them male and female, and God gave humanity the wonderful gift of sex within the context of marriage. People, some people think sex is yucky. Some people think marriage is a tool of the, of the man, right? No, no. Scripture says that God has given us sex within the context of marriage as something that gives glory to him, as something that makes life more enjoyable for us, as something that protects women and, and, and produces children and protects them, as something that builds society. And so it's not enough for us to just say, well, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. What has God given instead? He has given us a wonderful, precious gift of marriage and of sex therein. But do you see what happens? When we neglect the gift that God has given us, this is where we go. When we neglect the gift of marriage, when we abuse the gift of marriage, when we neglect and abuse the gift of sex that God has given us, people turn into perverts. Remember when we used to be able to use that word? That word doesn't mean anything anymore. People turn into perverts who do all kinds of weird stuff. Men become scoundrels who, abuse, who accuse their wives of, of whatever. Men become scoundrels who, who, who rape women and who violate betrothals. Men and women agree to violate the beautiful covenant gift of marriage that God has given us. This is what happens when we don't live by God's design and when we turn and go whichever way that we want to go. Now, you might not be tempted to do any of these. But you know what we're tempted to do today is to neglect and abuse marriage. Now, there's a few examples of this. I, I, I could bring up a whole bunch. I'm just going to bring up a couple. There's divorce. Our culture loves divorce. Divorce is something now that, that it's so easy to do. And people move from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage. They neglect marriage. They abuse marriage. And it does not turn out pretty, does it? I'm sure you know people. Maybe you are one yourself. Some of the most pain that I've ever seen people go through, some of the most pain that I've ever been through is because of someone that I love got divorced. You've seen it. Maybe you've been through it. Now, do you see what I'm saying? When we have the gift of marriage that God has given us and we neglect it and we abuse it, it turns out to be hell, doesn't it? Now, you might not be tempted to accuse your bride of not being a virgin. You may not be tempted to commit adultery physically. You may not be tempted to violate a betrothal or to sleep with your stepmother or your father's other wife. Those might not quite be what you're into. But beloved, can I get frank for a second? Brothers, can I speak to you frankly for a second? We watch pornography. Statistically speaking, it is a fact that there are men in this room who view pornography. And we look at this and we say, how could people do stuff like this? How could you watch pornography? We say, how could a guy treat his wife like this? How could you treat your wife like this? How could this guy want to want to victimize a girl that's betrothed or not? How could you watch pornography? Brothers, we not might we might not be tempted to do this, but it's safe to say, it's a fact. We're tempted to watch pornography. This kind of stuff is easier now. I don't even know. There, there's so many things that I could say and, and, and I could spend the rest of the day talking about why pornography is wrong and how Christ can rescue us from pornography. Let me just say this, brothers. Come out of the dark. 
You think that you're alone, you're not. You think you're the, only, you're, you're the only one in the trenches fighting this battle, you're not. You think that you've been fighting this your whole life and it's never gone anywhere, you're not. You know, in the Soviet Union, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, he said that the blue caps, they were like the SS. They were the secret police that were out um, arresting everybody. And he says, people knew what was going on. And he says, you know, if we all would have just stood up and said, no, we're not going to go for this, Soviet Union wouldn't have gone the way that it did. Brothers, if we would all just embrace one another and confess to each other that we, we'd struggle with lust and that we consume pornography, brothers, if we would stand up and say, we're not going to do this anymore. Do you have any idea what it's doing to your wives? To your children? We say... How can people violate marriage like this? Brothers, we destroy our wives and our children with pornography. Come out of the dark. Confess your sin to one another. Brothers, let's fight it together. There's a couple of books I could recommend, because of course I can. Number one is Finally Free by Heath Lambert. By far the best. By far the best book I've read on pornography. There's another one, and this one isn't just about pornography. It's called Indwelling Sin. It's by a guy named John Owen. It's just about the fact that we as Christians are still indwelt with sin, and sin is just constantly with us wherever we go. And there's just this fight that's always happening, and we neglect it, and we don't fight. And, and, and what wretched people we are. Amen? It's not just me, right? <laughs> Indwelling Sin by John Owen. Now, he's an old Puritan, and he's kind of hard to read sometimes, so... If you get the one that you can't read, let me know and I'll help you find the version that's easier to read. This is what happens when we neglect the gift that God has given us in marriage and in sex. God has given us an avenue for us to express ourselves and, 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 and for us to enjoy sex and marriage. And when we neglect it, this is what we do. So what does this have to do with Jesus? Let me give you a few statements about what this has to do with Jesus. Number one. Jesus understands a life surrounded by sexual stigma. Jesus lived under the stigma of sexual immorality. You're, you're saying, what do I mean by that? Joseph knew that his wife was pregnant before they got married. And do you know what? Joseph wasn't the only one. We find in the Gospels that when Jesus is engaging people, they're bringing up the fact that his mother is a whore. Mark chapter 6 is an example. When Jesus goes and preaches to the church in his own hometown, the synagogue in his own hometown, do you remember what they said? Isn't this the son of Mary? And that doesn't really strike our ears. We go, well, yeah, he's Mary's son. No, no, no. Friends, you did not call people by the name of their mother in those days. They were essentially calling him a bastard. Isn't this Mary's bastard kid? We don't even know who his dad is. They call him a Samaritan, a half-breed. The Talmud says that his mom was a hairdresser and she was sleeping with a Roman mercenary. John chapter 8, when Jesus is engaging his enemies, they say, we were not born of sexual immorality. Implication, you were. Who do you think you are to teach us with your mom and the way that your life started out? Right? Right? Isn't that amazing that God, who is holy and pure, came and lived life among us and took on himself our shame, and part of that shame included the fact that people looked on him and saw the child of a forbidden union. Jesus had people look on him and, and believe that there was some kind of impurity about him when of all people who ever lived, there was none. Is that amazing or what? So you know what that means? Jesus is compassionate if you have that same stigma. So here's my second statement for you. Jesus was and is kind to the sexually immoral. Jesus was and is kind to the sexually immoral. You see Jesus, people running into, the, running into people in the Gospels, and there, there's a number of people who are sexually immoral. And when Jesus engages them, he doesn't say, ew, yuck, when other people would. Jesus is kind to them. Jesus loves them. Jesus shows them dignity and honor that nobody else would. Case in point, the Samaritan woman. 
And he even calls her out on her sin, right? You've been married a few times, and you're living with a guy right now who's not even your husband. And yet he did so in a way that he was kind, and he hooked her, and, and, and she ended up becoming this evangelist to the Samaritans. It is amazing. And she's not the only example. Jesus was and is kind to the sexually immoral. People who've been divorced, people who've slept around. So just let me say this to you. You look at this text, you hear what I said about pornography, you think about divorce, you think about some of the things that you've done. Friends, if you are sexually immoral, Jesus will not say, ew, yuck, to you. Jesus wants to be kind to you. And if people look on you and know that you've been divorced multiple times, and if people look on you and they know that you've been sleeping around or that you slept around in, in, in your day, or if you look in the mirror and you see a person who's been divorced or who has been around and you see damaged goods, friends, Jesus does not see damaged goods. Jesus was and is kind to the sexually immoral. Thirdly, Jesus himself never succumbed to sexual temptation. Jesus himself never sinned once. And scripture tells us that he is tempted in every, he was tempted in every single way that we are and yet without sin. And so friends, we look at where we have failed and we know that Jesus conquered. And so we have hope. If it was just up to us looking in the mirror and knowing that I have not kept the law and I have not kept God's standard and I have slept around and I've done this and that. Look, if that was all of our hope, we would be toast. We would be lost. But we have hope in someone else. And it's not in the law of Moses. It's Jesus who fulfilled the law of Moses. It's Jesus who could fast for 40 days and still resist the devil when he tells him to turn the stones into bread. It's Jesus who's sweating drops of blood and could call a legion of angels to his side and be done and move on and go back to heaven who refused to. Friends, you and I have fallen. You and I have sinned. We are stained with the guilt of sexual immorality. Jesus is not. And that means that he can rescue us from our sin. That means he can rescue us from our guilt and our shame. Fourthly, Jesus can empower us by his spirit to resist sexual temptation. If you will repent of your sins and if you'll give yourself to Jesus Christ, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit, while we might not be strong enough, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We in ourselves can't resist this kind of temptation. We fail in thought, word, and deed. And yet, if you are in Christ and if you have his spirit dwelling in you, you have the same power that empowered him to, withhold, to withstand that temptation. Galatians chapter 5 says that we're not to carry out the desires of the flesh, but we are to walk in the spirit. Friends, if you're in Christ, you do have the spirit, but you might not be walking according to the spirit. And so scripture tells us, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. It does not say that the flesh will shut up. It does not say that the flesh will stop desiring things. It says that if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Jesus, through his Spirit, can empower us to withstand the temptation now look, if you're in Christ, you're wondering, can I avoid this stuff? Can I step away from pornography? Can I step away from this? Yes, you can, through the power of Christ and his spirit. And if you're not in Christ and you, you feel like I'm a slave, you are. But you can be set free by Jesus. So this is the final statement. Jesus forgives and rescues the sexually immoral. Jesus forgives and rescues the sexually immoral. If you will come to him, he will forgive you of your sin. You, you feel like you can never forgive yourself. By the way, I hate that language. Forgive yourself. I don't know. You don't need to forgive yourself. You need God to forgive you. But for the sake of argument, you look in the mirror and you can't forgive yourself. The most important thing is that if you're in Christ, he forgives you of your sexual sin. And he can rescue us from our sexual sin. 
and we're living in a fallen and a cursed world where we neglect marriage and we abuse marriage. We're surrounded by pornography. We're surrounded by lust. We fantasize things in our mind. There's, there's all kinds of things in this dark and bleak world, and we say, oh, wretched man that I am, who can set me free from this body of death? You know the answer. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ can rescue us from this wretched, vile condition. Shall we tie everything together? This text in the background is telling us, it's implying the beauty and, and the wonderful gift that God has given us in marriage. And it gives us a number of examples. When we neglect and when we abuse God's gift of marriage, we turn into perverts and we do all kinds of horrible things, men and women. But the good news of the gospel is that where the law can't fix our sexual immorality, where the law can't forgive our sexual immorality, where the law can't rescue us, it can just amputate. Jesus became a curse for us. The law pronounces a curse on us that if we don't keep the law, that we are cursed by not confirming the words of the law by doing them. Jesus pronounces a blessing and, bl and pronounces forgiveness on us if we will come to him. So friends, can I just say one more time, come out of the dark. Don't walk alone anymore. Now look, there's, there's, other, there's all kinds of other things that we could bring up. We could bring up, well, what, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 19, there's people who are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. That's fine. Paul says he wishes everybody was like that. If I had more time, then I would preach on being single for the sake of the kingdom. Because that's some of you, for one reason or another. That's great. I'm sorry that I don't have an application for you today. Beloved, let us prize and cherish marriage. Brothers, go home and enjoy your wife. You ask, what should I do instead? Like, what's going to keep me from this? It's not just the power of the Spirit. It's the fact that God gave us the gift of marriage. And Proverbs 7 tells us, enjoy her breasts at all times. Let them satisfy you at all times. Go home and enjoy your spouse. Go home and thank Christ that he has rescued us from our sexual immorality and that he has conquered sexual immorality and that in him we have victory over sin. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift that you have given us when you made us male and female. And when you made us to live in community and when you made us to live in marriage and to be fruitful and to multiply and to enjoy each other. Father, we see in your word that when we turned away from you, we turned away from your design. All of the world became chaos, especially our bedrooms. We confess to you, Lord, that we have fallen short, that we, in one way or another, have not lived up to the standard you've given us in your law. We confess, Lord, that as the adulterers in this text and the rapists in the text, we deserve to be stoned to death. Father, we also recognize that in your love and in your mercy, you wanted to save us. You wanted to forgive us. You wanted to transform us and rescue us from sin. And so you sent your only son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. Father, if any of us here don't know him, we pray that you would draw us to yourself in, in repentance and in faith and that we would cast ourselves on him when we see our wretched condition of being sexually immoral. Father, for those of us who do know you and who are struggling with sexual sin, we pray that you would enlighten us with what your word says and we pray that you would empower us with what your spirit can do in us. We pray that you would help us to walk in the spirit and to fight the sin that so easily surrounds us and entangles us. Help us, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would have mercy on us. Amen.